So Jesus' favorite word in today's gospel was watch, right? To be attentive, to be mindful and aware and open to where the Lord of the house or when the Lord of the house returns, that when the Son of Man returns, we are waiting for him, right? That we're not sleeping. Uh, I think in this time for the church, we are in that in-between time. Right? The full revelation of Jesus Christ, the full revelation of God in Jesus Christ has happened. The conquering of sin and death happened on the cross. The final victory has been won, but that has not been consummated yet. So we're in this season, this time where we are still awaiting the full revelation of Jesus Christ, as the letter from St. Paul says from the second reading. Right? We are awaiting that time. And I think waiting is common for all of us that we are in the middle of a, a very human condition of waiting for things. From the day, first day that I started at the Air Force Academy in basic training, I had to know how many days I had until graduation. I don't remember exactly, but it was like 13, 1,300 and... 75 days until graduation. And I needed to know how many days each of the upperclassmen had until graduation. And every day you counted down how many days were left until you graduated. You were waiting for that day. A big celebration was called Hundreds Night, 100 nights before you graduated. You had a big party to count down the final 100 nights before graduation. We are kind of in the midst of that waiting period. We're not as intentional, and we don't know the day or the hour of when the master of the house will return, but we have a vigilance, right? We have a perseverance, a consistency, an awareness, and attentiveness to God's coming. Both his initial coming that we celebrate at Christmas, and so we have 22 days until we celebrate Christmas, but also that final coming that Christ has for us when he returns in glory and there's a new heaven and a new earth, perhaps in each of our own lives for our own death, when we come to that moment of crossing through the doorway of death and in each day of our lives that Christ shows up. That there is a way, though, I think, in this common human condition of waiting that I, I'm indebted to Dr. Sturzel, who we had a conversation about this earlier this week, and he put me on, and I haven't quite memorized it, so you'll appreciate, especially after my little gaffe at the beginning, <laughs> that I'm going to read this to you. Uh, it is from a very high theological source, very erudite, Dr. Seuss. <laughs> In Oh, the Places You Go, he's got one poem that is The Waiting Place. And he shares, or he writes, Waiting for a train to go or a bus to come or a plane to go, or the mail to come, or the rain to go, or the phone to ring, or the snow to snow, or waiting around for a yes or no, or waiting for their hair to grow. Everyone is just waiting. Waiting for the fish to bite, or waiting for a wind to fly a kite, or waiting around for Friday night or waiting, perhaps, for their Uncle Jake, or a pot to boil, or a better break, or a string of pearls, or a pair of pants, or a wig with curls, or a second chance. Everyone is just waiting. I think all of us in that position, we in the church are in a special position of waiting, waiting for the second coming of Christ, but all of us in our lives experience that waiting. We all experience a sense of desire to have what we want or having to delay what we want. And I think that in this period, both for us and our own attentiveness and staying awake, but also as we navigate through all the different waitings that we do in our lives, uh, whether it's big news or small news, if, whether it's a small inconvenience in the checkout line at the grocery store, or as I experienced over the summer, waiting for a test result, right? There are significant ways that we can approach that waiting with God. How do we wait intentionally with him? 
And so I'm gonna take another analogy and you know how much I like to go backpacking or hiking. And so imagine our waiting in the wilderness, our waiting on a trail, going out into the back country and, and doing our waiting time, the, the progression of days as I did at the academy. How do you progress through a period of waiting for something to be fulfilled, for God to come, to show up in our lives? How do we do it? And I think that there's four orientations that are important for that sense of waiting. The first orientation is our openness to God, right? That in the midst of the waiting, we don't see it as an abandonment or an isolation or a distance from God. That in fact, we open our hearts and our lives to that presence that we continue and stay consistent in the practices that build the relationship we have with Jesus. This is really the orientation upward and the orientation of love of God? How do we continue to be faithful in the midst of the struggles or the uncertainties or the things that we may be going through and awaiting? We try to stay in love with God, to be oriented towards Him in the midst of our waiting. I think the second orientation is that we then also look back. We look at God's faithfulness through time. Where has God shown up in our lives in the past? Where has he been present in our world in the past? What are the significant things that God has done for his people, for us? And we look back to those things. One of the things we look back to every time we gather together on Sundays is his suffering, death, and resurrection on the cross. The great gift of love for us, the gift of himself for us that's made present here for us that we remember and we look back towards those things, towards God's faithfulness. And that's really an orientation of trust. It's an orientation of placing our trust in God and walking with him hand in hand in the midst of the period or time of waiting. And then I think we look forward. Right? We look forward to the promises of God, to God's fulfillment and consummation of history and time, of, of the promise of immortality, of life everlasting, of a new heaven and of a new earth, of all the goodness that God has to give us and where God will be all in all. And so we look forward in that orientation with hope. And so we have an orientation of love and an orientation of trust and an orientation or faith and an orientation of hope. And then I think the secret part of that is that we also look down at the path that we're on. What has God set before us? What are the tasks that we have, the obligations we have? What are the things that are opportunities that lie on the path before us? How do we act? How do we have an orientation of action or of discipleship? How do we, we don't just wait passively as Christians, we wait in action with what God has placed before us, what he calls us to, and who he calls us to be. And so our orientation of love and of faith and of hope is grounded in the actions that we do. In the season of Advent, I encourage you to find an action or two or 20 to do. How are you going to supplement this season to help become more awake and attentive and looking for the coming of Jesus? What will you add to your practice or what will you be consistent in in what you try to practice to be able to, to grow in that openness and awareness of God's presence in our lives? Make it count this year. Make it the best Advent you've ever had. Help it to wake up your spirit to the power of God's promises, to his faithfulness in the past, for the great love that he has for you and for me and for what he calls each of us to do and to be. We come to this Eucharist as kind of a wake-up call, and I write about it a little bit in, our, in the bulletin article about it being an alarm, right? It kind of wakes us up today to this new season, wakes us up to God's presence and his coming, wakes us up out of all the busyness, out of the complacency, out of the indifference of all of the things that we kind of go through in our lives about all the worries and troubles and cares and concerns. Because God is in our midst. He is here. And he comes to be with his people. He is Emmanuel, whom we call for. The God who is with us. 
May this Eucharist serve as a beginning for us for this Lenten season, only 22 days long this year. May it open our hearts and our minds, our eyes and our ears and our hearts to God's presence in our midst. That we can, with faith, hope, and love, put that into practice as we walk through this season with Jesus.